What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Run Disney 101. I'm your host, Lake Sprinkle, joined today with my wife, Katie. And today, we're going to be talking about corrals A to Z. All right. So what what that means, corrals A to Z, we're going to do a quick, like, what are corrals, if you're, you know, new to running. Um, but then we're also going to talk about the experience of being in a high corral and the things you may experience if you're in a lower corral. So do you want to go into what corrals are? So if you've never done a run Disney race or a larger race in general, uh, there are thousands of people at these races and they don't just line you all up at the start line and say, all right, go ahead. What they do is they split you into corrals. You submit a time from a previous race and they take that time and they put you into categories, essentially fastest to slowest. And Run Disney actually has a list out uh, saying what times are going to get you into what corral. Um, they release this for each race, but typically it's almost always the same. When you go to register, they have different levels that you pick. Um, they say like, do you think you'll finish under an hour 45? Do you think you'll finish between 145 and 2? Like, they, they split it up for you to pick when you register as well. And then you have to provide a proof of time for each of those. Yes. Um, and you can say that you're going to run, like, under a certain time. Uh, but if you don't submit a proof of time, it, they're not going to put you up in a higher corral. So here's how it works. If you anticipate that you're going to finish your half marathon, anything less than two hours and 45 minutes, you are required to submit a proof of time. And now let's say this is your first race and you don't have a proof of time. It has to be a chip time race um, of some sort, Disney or not. It can be a non-Disney race. If you don't have one of those, a lot of people will go find a non-Disney race. Um, it doesn't have to be a half marathon. It has to be a 10K or higher, I believe. Yes. You can go do one of those locally and, uh, you know, run really hard and get a good proof of time. If you don't want to do that, then you should, when you register, pick 245 or higher. Um, otherwise, you're just going to automatically get bumped back anyway. So yeah. something to keep in mind. Now, this is only true for half marathons. If you're doing a 10K, there's no proof of time required through Disney. However... If you are running the challenge, they do basically take your proof of time from the half and equate that through. Yes. Um, so yeah. you do get placed in a higher corral still. Um, that's the general um, water corral yeah. facts. Depending on the size of the race, uh, at races like Princess and uh, Walt Disney World Weekend, you'll sometimes get back to K and N, which is like... 14 or 15 corrals, whereas at Star Wars, it usually only goes to, like, H, I. H or I. Yeah, typically. Yeah. So, and all that means is um, on race morning, um, you'll have your bib. It'll say what your corral number is on it. When you go to line up for your race start, um, they have volunteers stationed at each corral entrance, and they're checking to make sure that you're going in the correct corral. This is for everyone's benefit, um, and it kind of leads us into, you know, the main thing we wanted to talk about and the differences between being in a higher and lower corral, um, and why if you are truly timed to be in a lower corral, you probably don't want to be up in that higher corral, mm -hmm. <laughs> and vice versa. If you are a fast runner, you probably don't want to be in a lower corral, and you've actually experienced that before. Yes, uh, and I'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. Two other points to make. You can drop back corrals. Mm -hmm. So if you are running with a friend and say you are corral B and corral C, you have to go back to the uh, basically highest corral of lowest, your group. Lowest corral. Well, the furthest back. Furthest back. So you both cannot do corral B. You have to drop back to corral C or whatever the lowest person in your group is. Yep. And then uh, basically how this affects the race is um, Corral A, the fastest runners, are the first people to start. And then a couple minutes later, uh, they will start the next wave or corral and so on and so forth. And what this does is it helps spread out the race. Um, and then if you're wondering about the 16, mer 16 mile, minute, minute mile. mile pace that you have to hold, this is actually started from the very last runners that start the race. If you are up in a higher corral, uh, 
and you may have trouble holding that time, that does actually give you a little bit of extra buffer. time. Um, which is really nice to know, especially if you're a slower runner. It's good to it's good to know that you have that buffer sometimes. Mm -hmm. You'll learn a lot more as we go into our comparison, and we're gonna throw in some good tips, I think, um, especially for lower corral runners. Um, I've learned a lot of lower corral tips through the years. So we're gonna divide this into two parts. We're gonna talk about the difference in experience being in the corrals before the race start. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk about the differences in what you might experience on the race course. Obviously, at that point, you're not in your corrals anymore, but it does determine kind of timing um, <laughs> how your race may go. So um, why don't you start um, and let and tell us when you're in a high corral, usually he's in corral A. He's been in corral A, I think, for at least the last couple of years for every race. Is that right? Star Wars 2018 was my first time in Corral A. I and I think believe. since then you've been in Corral A every time. Twenty It's 2017 was my okay. first time in well, A. Well, my point of asking that question was to show he's experienced in this. <laughs> so um, what is, what's the atmosphere like in Corral A? What do you see people doing? Um, what kind of conversations do you have? Like what, what do you see when you, when you get into your Corral? Um, so my first time in Corral A was actually rather intimidating, to be honest. Uh, it's a little more quiet. We're usually either all the way in the front or all the way in the corner, kind of away from the crowd, which is definitely nice. We're not typically the dancing loud corral, um, and commonly the DJ <laughs> will make fun of that. But you definitely see a lot more like athletically oriented people um and that was a weird way to word that but what i really mean is there's a lot more people like doing warm-up runs doing actual full stretching uh, compared to some of the further back corrals where people may just kind of sit down and wait for the race uh, so a lot more of that going on other than that it actually is a very positive experience as i said the first time was intimidating but now that i've met and made some friends it's really just like any corral you can talk to anyone uh, most people are going to be more than happy to share their thoughts on you know yeah. different races what they think of the day so on i think one cool thing about being in a higher corral and being in, in a corral in corral a is especially at Disney races where you get a lot of repeat people. Repeat people who are in Corral A can't go anywhere else. They're not moving up, going to a different corral. Mm -hmm. So you have seen a lot more of the same people every time compared to me. Um, probably the coolest thing that's happened to me sitting in a corral is I've like gone and sat down and realized that like the person sitting right in front of me was a friend from college. Or I saw an old friend that I met um, through my first wine and dine um, was like walking up into one of my corrals at Star Wars one year. Like those were just really random happenstance. You've actually like run into the same people over and over and developed true friendships, you know, from being in Corral A over and over again, which I think is really cool. Yeah, there are quite a few people that I actually look forward to seeing <laughs> in the beginning of the corrals. A couple people who I actively run with during these races now and some people who I just see on the course basically every time now. Yep. And it's really a lot of fun now. Yeah. So question for you, and I don't know, you might have to think about it for a second, but of your estimate, when you get into the corral compared to when you start, how long do you think you're in your corral waiting? I mean, that depends on how early you get to the corral. Well, okay, so let's say we get to the corral right when it opens, which in, in the past few times we have gotten there right when they open the corrals. How long is that time? Um, usually they open at about 4.45. 4.45, 4.30. And the race goes varies. off. 5.30. 5.30. So you have anywhere between an hour to 45 minutes between actually going to your corral and starting to run. Did you say? Yeah. Um, okay. And typically we the wheelchairs and the push strollers, all of those start right before us. So we pretty much start right at that 5.30 time. Okay. All right. I bring that up because that's a big difference between yes. a top corral and some of these lower corrals. Corrals A and B, you know, the first part of C, if you can get to the front, you're, you know, potentially waiting 45 minutes to an hour if you get there right when the corral's open. If you get there right when the corral's open and you're in, you know, 
EFGH, you may have a very long time to wait in your corral. And this can bring up a couple of issues, um, which is like our first corral tip maybe. Um, if you're in a lower corral, some of these race mornings can be really cold. <laughs> and once you start running, you know, in 60 degree weather, it's fine. You know, you don't need a blanket. You don't need a sweatshirt. But if you're sitting in the dark in 60 degree weather, not moving for almost two hours, like you might want to bring a throwaway, you know, blanket, sweatshirt, mylar blanket if you have one, just to help you kind of keep a little warm. <laughs> Another thing that might happen, and it's happened a few years, where you might get a drizzle, you might get a little bit of rain. If there's rain in the forecast, I highly suggest bringing, again, something to wrap up in, a poncho, something you don't mind throwing away, because if it's just a drizzle, um, avoid getting wet before you start running. Mm -hmm. Other things to think about being in a lower corral with your wait time in, you know, waiting for the race to start, um, things you'll need to keep in mind, nutrition. If you eat something in your hotel room at 2.30 in the morning, but you're not running until 6.30, that's going to bring up a couple things with nutrition. One, you may need to have a goo or have some stingers right before you start, especially if you're a slower runner and you're going to be out mm -hmm. there a long time. Two, it brings up the issue of bathrooms. <laughs> I always uh, go try to hit the porta potties once or twice on our way to the corral and try like my darndest <laughs> to you know, go. <laughs> because if you're waiting in the corral and you've worked hard to get to the front of your corral, so you have the most time to finish that race, but it's 6.15 and you have to go to the bathroom all of a sudden and you have to go all the way out of the corral, use the bathroom, you're not getting back to the front of that corral. You're going to get stuck in the back. There's no bathrooms like in the corral. They're all outside of that area. Make sure you're thinking about that. Make sure you go to the bathroom. Um, I always try to be hydrated the week before, but not necessarily drink a lot of water waiting for the race to start. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause you to have to go to the bathroom too. I bring enough nutrition for the race, but I always bring something that's designated as like my pre-race nutrition to get me started. <laughs> Yes, and that's usually the same for the front corral. Uh, most people pop a goo or whatever your energy um, pack of choice is right before the race. There's just way less people. Like, right. I've left my corral, gone to the bathroom, and walked my way back up towards the front. Um, even if you get stuck in the rear of the people, from the time that your corral starts to the time that you go is maybe 20 seconds. Right, and that brings up another point. If you are a speedier runner... Um, he could, you could start in the back of Corral A, and because it's a chip time race, as long as you're not going for that number one spot that is actually based on clock time, you could still have a great time being in Corral A and starting in the back, mm -hmm. because everyone else in that corral is also running fast. They're not getting in your way. You probably don't have as many bottlenecks, you know, et cetera, all the things that cause slowdowns. Um, and this is getting a little bit onto the race course, which we want to save. That so is, though, true of later corrals. Um, so say you're not in corral A. Um, you may not win the race overall. In fact, you probably will not um, <laughs> if you're starting corral C because you're going to be... I could, could actually yeah. clock time. Because to win the race overall, it's clock time. You have to be yeah. the fastest person. So it's clock. literally the first three people. But for age placement, which are the awards that you can see, sorry, behind my shoulder here and behind <laughs> Katie's, they are based off of clock time. So you could start in a later corral and still place um, ahead of people who had finished before you. Yep. So other things to talk about with the corrals. Um, one thing I love about being in lower corrals is, and it goes along with that, you have more time in the corrals. Um, you have more time to talk to people. Um, you're sitting there for a while. Usually what happens is you get into the corral, you're surrounded by people, you're stuck there for, you know, <laughs> over an hour usually. Usually starts off kind of quiet for like 25 minutes and people are only talking to like the people they're there with. And then eventually you get so bored that you just start talking to all these complete strangers around you and asking where they're from, how many races they've done. Um, and, and you start to kind of build a little camaraderie. And then a lot of these people you see later on if you're a similar speed mm -hmm. runner, and that's always fun. They have um, the MCs, you know, kind of entertaining you during this corral time. And because you're, stand you're there for so long, you get to see more of this, like, pre-race show, you know. So after they send off 
the first corral. They're still up there cracking jokes. They're showing people in costumes. They usually have one um, one MC on the ground who's like interviewing people. It's it's a fun atmosphere, and you you get to enjoy more of it. And and I I think that's kind of a perk. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's entertainment, and they get you excited for the race. Most of the races, if not all the races, when each corral is let off, there's uh, fireworks that go off. Um, mm-hmm. If you're in the later corral, you get to see fireworks. Yes, we <laughs> you do. You know, 20, 30 times. <laughs> Typically, I get to see the wheelchair fireworks and then my own corral's fireworks, and that's it. Um, which kind of stinks if you're someone who wants to like get a picture or a video of it. You have because a you really lot of have one chance. You have a lot of opportunity to get good videos and pictures of the fireworks, I will say. Other fun things, you know, usually, like, already alluded to this when he was talking about kind of how A is more... Uh, very concentrated on stretching and warming up in the back. Um, you know, they're playing music. People are dancing. People are singing along. They usually do some kind of like singing or dance competition between the corrals, like, you know, and they, you know, decide a winner, like Corral H for the best dancers, you know, things like that. And it really is more of a party atmosphere. Um, I feel like compared to what you told me, I've never actually experienced Corrales, so I can't say from my own (laughs) (laughs) knowledge, but it's a lot of fun. And then you also get a lot of people who are new, who aren't lifetime runners, who it's their very first running event ever, and they've overcome major challenges to be there and you see them and I always like to see if someone, you know, looks kind of nervous, you know, and they're alone. I always like to like, you know, see how they're doing and tell them, you know, give them some tips. And, yeah, it, it's fun. So there's definitely positives to being lower in the corral. Now, I will say, if um, we've already talked about it a little bit, if it is your first race or you're worried about your time, the biggest tip I can give is to um, get to the race around 4.15, 4.30, which is usually when they open the corrals and try to get in the front of your corral because that'll give you the most time. They fill up quick in the back because – People know about this. The back corrals fill up, so you want to see if you can get to the front. Yep. Don't push. Don't push and shove, but, you know, politely try to get you up to the front. (laughs) And I think that's about it for before the race starts. So we're actually going to break this into two videos, just because this is running a little long. I like to So (laughs) go ahead and check out our second part of Corrals A to Z. On the course. that linked. Yep. (laughs) But thanks so much for watching. Uh, If you have any other questions about Run Disney or you have a Run Disney topic you want us to discuss, let us know in the comments below. And thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. There you go. (laughs) 